like to uh, introduce uh, our APA president, Mitchell Silver. Uh, Mitch has been uh, president now for one year. It's a four-year term, president-elect, two years as president, and one year as immediate past. He's also been on the board for our two terms, and I've gotten to know him very well, gotten to respect him greatly. Uh, he's having an awful lot of fun. Uh, when he uh, wrote about planning a couple of years ago, he started a piece by saying, I am proud to be a planner. And I think we all know that he is proud to be a planner, and I hope that everybody in this room is proud to be a planner. It's tough work, it's rewarding work, it's important work. Uh, and the, the new strategic plan that the board adopted under Mitch's leadership uh, calls on us to inspire, lead, and innovate. Mitch has been doing that in his career, uh, in senior management positions in New York City and Washington, D.C., and for the last seven years in the second fastest growing city in America, Raleigh, North Carolina. He went there as planning director, uh, and in recognition of his good work, uh, his city manager asked him a couple of years ago to take on a portfolio uh, of, uh, I think, some seven or eight departments. So he is the chief planning officer, uh, but he also oversees economic development, community development, housing permitting, and a series of other functions as well. Uh, in addition to helping run the city of Raleigh, uh, and a lot of it uh, through technology, he uh, has been an incredible uh, motivational speaker, uh, on behalf of planning and all of you throughout this country for the last year, and I'm sure we'll continue to do so during the next year. So please welcome the APA President, Mitchell Silver, AICP. Well, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, just so that you know, it's a, first, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to welcome you to L.A. And I want to thank the mayor for his leadership. I got a chance to spend some time with the mayor uh, as part of the Mayor's Institute for Community Design. And he certainly is a leader and a strong voice for reimagining cities. Now, you'll notice in the upper corner, uh, if you are on Twitter, uh, it's called hashtag APA 2012. If you don't know what hashtag is, that means you don't know about Twitter. Uh, but I was introduced to Twitter last year by... Jennifer Evans Cowley. Uh, it is quite addictive. So for those of you that want to get involved, so Jennifer, if you're in the room, thank you for getting me addicted. I do have to go to rehab soon to learn how to get off of it, but it is a very exciting medium, so those of you who want to follow this, please make sure you have that on hashtag. Now, I want to start off just by, I'll talk about age and generation in a second, but I turned 50 about a year ago, and don't look surprised. Some of you look so shocked. And a friend of mine sent me this list, I guess, to cheer me up. How many people are excited about turning 50? Oh. I'm excited to hear that. I didn't feel the same way. So they sent me this list, I assume, to cheer me up. And so if those of you who are not 50, you have something to look forward to. So in terms of the top five perks, the first one, which is very exciting, is that people call you at 9 p.m. and ask, did I wake you? The second perk is that in a hostage situation, you're likely to be released first. <laughs> so don't worry about world traveling. Number three, the things you buy won't wear out. <laughs> Number four, you can now eat dinner at 4 p.m. <laughs> and my ultimate favorite, your secrets are safe with your friends because they can't remember them either. <laughs> Now, uh, I'm very excited about this conference because the profession started in 1909. We're now in the 21st century, and we are entering the second century of our profession. And with all of the amazing trends, if you're just coming out of school, you picked a no better time to be active in this profession and to start. If you've been here for a while, you have a chance to continue to contribute to what is happening because there are emerging trends that are happening that we need planners to step up. So this conference is appropriately titled Reinvent, Reinvigorate, and Reimagine. And we are so happening that we're do we're happy that we're doing that here in LA. Now, I want to also acknowledge, even though Paul did that, uh, all of our leaders. So if you're a member of the board, the commission, our international partners and guests, chapter presidents, division chairs, interest groups, 
de de professional development officers, student representatives, local host committee, and anyone who ever volunteered for APA, please stand. It's going to be a lot of you. All of you, please. And a special guest, my wife, Mary, and Rachel are also here this morning. Please give them a round of applause because they allowed me to travel almost every week to share the good message of planning with you. So they're right here in the front. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> my daughter will certainly make me pay for this later. But the reason why I say that is I want to thank you. We have a thankless profession at times, and you don't often hear the thank you. And I say that because a lot of people say, we're not sure if we're making a difference. And on behalf of all the people, I want to tell you that it's because of you we have clean air and clean water. It's because of you that people are living healthier. It's because of you we have safer neighborhoods. It's because of your work People have access to jobs, have decent housing, and have jobs and a stable economy because of the work that you do. So please, I don't want to hear again that planners do not make a difference. So for all those years of hard work and for all those times people didn't say anything, I'm saying to you, thank you. Thank you for the work that you do because it is important. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And as I travel the country and we have this conversation, I hear a lot of things that they call planners. This is the nice list. <laughs> I hear regulators, facilitators, processors. Not that processing is bad, but that we process, we're enforcers, that we are the profession that tells people or other people what to do with their property. And everyone knows what I'm talking about. But when I hear this thing about process, because sometimes planners are so enamored with process that I get concerned that we may just recall our profession, the American Process Association. Anybody vote for that? <laughs> process is important. But my concern is that we must put planning back as the P in APA. And under my presidency, that's what I hope that we can do. Process is important, but planning is needed today more than ever. I believe the biggest concern that's going on right now is that for some of you, not all of you, that planners have lost their sense of purpose. When you have a purpose, you speak differently. When you have a purpose, you plan with authority. When you have a purpose, you do your jobs differently. And what I see as I travel is that some planners have lost their sense of purpose. You may have heard me say this before, but what we do is relevant. Planners want to be relevant. You want to have purpose for what you do. You are relevant. And I said this before, planners, you are guardians of the future. This is what separates us from other professions. It makes us unique. We look to the future and we say, public, we got your back. We're thinking about generations that aren't even born yet. What makes us different is that we protect the public interest. That is unique to our profession. And as I travel, I ask one question. Planners, if you do not protect the public interest, please tell me who will. There are enlightened elected officials. There are many citizens that are committed. But our profession, as part of our code of ethics, is embodied in protecting the public health, safety, and welfare. And I ask you to take that purpose seriously because this planet needs you to do that. We also know that planners have to have a special concern for long-term consequences of present actions. That's hard sometimes, because I go before the city council. I know a couple of staff members are here in the audience. And there are times I'm sweating under my arms, because I have to tell the council something they don't want to hear. But I have an ethical responsibility to think about those generations and to make sure I explain to the council the long-term consequences of this action. And it's not always easy to do. But I also want to remind you that there are consequences for no action. No action is an action. 
And as I travel the country, it breaks my heart because I see cities that are suffering from the consequences of no action. I see counties and small towns and villages and rural areas that are paying the consequences of no actions. I don't want to listen to you planners. I'm not concerned. Don't worry about it. As if taking no action means the problem's going to go away. You're just kicking it down the road and the problem becomes bigger. So planners, you have this awesome responsibility of not only looking at the long-term consequences of present actions, but to work with your community and your council to talk about the consequences of no action. And that one, to me, I think is one of the tragedies we're seeing now in the 21st century as we see budgets start to shrink as we do our work. America, quite simple. In fact, I'll go beyond America. This world needs to fall back in love with planning again. Do you remember how to fall in love? How you meditate and think about it day and night? You do. You need to fall back in love with planning again. In fact, <clears throat> I think <clears throat> you need to take out your zoning code and your comprehensive plan out for dinner. <clears throat> <laughs> Candlelight. Oh, how I love your bulk regulations. <laughs> in fact, how many people have heard of a road diet? You have. Well, I think you need to say to your zoning code, in all sheer love, it's time that America, we put our codes on a diet. We'll call it a code diet. All those overlays are just getting a little bit too heavy. <clears throat> How many use groups have you been eating? <laughs> 25 pages? <laughs> Look at some of your use groups. I don't even know what some of them mean. You need to fall back in love with planning again. America needs for you to fall back in love with planning again, and I hope you take that very seriously. Now, I've used this slide many times, and I think it's very important, because I try to communicate the purpose of what we do. There are challenges that we're experiencing right now in the 21st century that are game changers for not only this country, but this world. The items on this list have never happened before, many of them. And so you can't Google or rewind, look at the 20th century to figure out what do we do. These are new. It requires fresh ideas, big ideas, innovation, and courage to deal with this list. And some of these are game changers. The graying of America by 2030, one in five Americans will be over the age of 65. People the age of 85, they're going to triple in terms of the numbers to 20 million Americans by 2050. California is already a minority majority state by 2042. There will be no majority state in the United States. These are going to be game changers in our country as we see our children who need to compete in a global economy will be changing rapidly by 2050, 62% of our school-aged children will be what we call today minority, and we're going to have to redefine that term minority because there'll be different things in different people, to different people. Single-person households. Can you believe it? By 2020s, a single person will equal that of a family household, and by 2030, a single person household will be the clear majority. This will be a game changer for this country. And I often joke around that if you're traveling, and I can say this to Bruce, with you with Mary, and you're traveling, you see a family of five, I encourage you, take a picture, go home and say, honey, I saw a pic you saw how many? Five. Prove it. Here's the picture. Put on your refrigerator. Wow. Climate change. We heard a presentation from the president of, of the new Caribbean Plans Association that they're experiencing issues right now with climate change. We can't get into whether we believe those who deny it. This is a real, legitimate issue. And as planners, we have to be prepared for future generations because we are noticing changes in our climate and an increase in storm events. We have to be prepared. This will continue to be an emerging issue, as well as some of the others. I also want to talk about something I'm also experiencing. This whole term of urban, the two slides that you see, those two pictures, both of those are urban. And when I tell that to people sometimes, they go, no way. I can't believe it. 
Those two pictures are urban. And when we talk about the nation is 80% urbanized, it doesn't mean it's 80% cities. Urbanized includes city, suburb, rural, and fringe. We need to start communicating what we mean by that term because when you say urban to some people, it is a scary term, it takes on a popular culture term, and we have to be able to grow together urban, suburban, and rural. The biggest tragedy I see in the United States is it's city against rural areas, urban against rural. We have to grow together as a country as urban, suburban, and rural and let those economies tie themselves together. So we have to avoid this us versus them. So when you go out planners, make sure we have to grow together as a country to be successful. Because 60 million Americans, 20%, still live in areas that are not urbanized and we have to work with them and respect their issues that they're going through as well. So the census is trying to redefine, not redefine, but in 2000, they came up with a definition. I encourage you to look at it. This will help you have a conversation about what is urban and how we need to address some of these challenges. This is a picture of the urbanized areas as defined by the Census Bureau. And as you can see, there's both purple in terms of concentration, but there's a lot of white space. So this is to let you know, plans, the work that we do, we have to be successful in this country. We have to work together. Now, I want to take this point about sustainability, whether we call it the three E's or just green and smart. If we're truly serious about sustainability, I want to talk about the silent E for a second, equity. It is very important that we not forget equity. How many heard about the term greenwashing? Just raise your hands. This is what I'm concerned about in sustainability. If you lead out equity, then what you're doing really is equity washing. And we have to remember that if we want to do the three E's, let's not forget equity because that is vital to the work that we do. Otherwise, let's just drop that E and focus on the environment and the economy. And I'm sure you don't want to do that. What I'm pleased is that APA and its newest Sustaining Places initiative, which was led by uh, our former president, Bruce Knight, it develops eight principles on how we need to develop the comprehensive plan. And as you see number four, Interwoven equity is part of that. So I encourage you planners, as you do your work, if you truly believe in sustainability, do not forget equity, fairness, people. That is also part of the equation. And I say that because when we look at people, there are different generations. Those of you that know me, I have a lot of fun with this chart. I won't do that now, except I want to know, do we have anybody here from the greatest generation? You're 88 and above. Anyone here in the room? Because we want to honor you because your generation is truly the greatest generation. I do not see anyone, not one. Well, I heard a clap, maybe that's one. <laughs> Silent chosen mature generation, are you here in the room? You can scream out or you can just clap your hands. What about the immortals, the baby boomers? Are you here in the room? <laughs> Oh, stop it, you'll forget it tomorrow. <laughs> and the generation that Richard Florida calls the leading edge of the creative class, Gen X, are you here in the room? <clears throat> and then the generation that wants to be planning director after one year on the job, Gen Y! <laughs> and thank you. Rachel, you may be the sole representative of the Gen Z generation. Thank you for being here. But I want to stop here for a second because, folks, as you plan, planners, as you plan, you're planning for different markets. And I want to point out one thing about the greatest generation, and I read this in Thomas Friedman's book, and it leaped right off the page. The greatest generation is summed up this way. They gave their today for your tomorrow. They gave their today for your tomorrow, for our tomorrow. There is no other generation that's come close. In fact, the reverse is true today. We now have a generation that wants to give your tomorrow for our today. And planners, we need to help communicate that message so that we reverse it and we think about future generations. Because the values, needs, and aspirations of each one of those markets are different. 
You cannot just pay attention to the older generation. We have to involve all of them because it's their needs, values, and aspirations that's going to drive consumer preferences. That's why you see a desire to rent from the younger generation. That's why you'd see smaller homes because the market is changing. So please pay attention and not just plan. And for the younger generation, you have to reach out to them. They will not come to you. So that's very important to remember. Something else that's encouraging about you Gen Y generation, and this is encouraging, I want everyone to listen. We've never seen a generation that is more committed to volunteer than a millennial generation. And there's 80 million of them. They will volunteer for you as an intern on one condition. It's got to have a purpose or they walk. You are a purpose-driven generation, and we need you to stay that way because all those emerging trends that are on that list will happen under your watch. And we need you to maintain that purpose-driven uh, commitment to solve those problems. So please give Gen Y a hand because we need to encourage them, and there's about 15 of them here this week. <laughs> And us seasoned and wise professionals, we still have some gas in our tank. Let's help them out, but these challenges will be enormous and they will need our help. Now, in order to communicate planning in Raleigh, I had the honor of meeting all the planning directors ever in the history of Raleigh. We get together once a year. Herb Stevens, who is the oldest, he's 94, lives here in California and still flies planes. Just so that you know, I'm the black guy there in the slide in case you were confused. <laughs> right there. But I wanted to communicate to the residents of Raleigh what planning meant to our city. And so rather than pressing fast forward, I pressed the rewind button to let them know exactly the contributions, the 60 years of planning we've had in our city, what impact it had. Because people were surprised. There was Herb Stevens, who first came up with the concept of Green Fingers, which later became our world-renowned greenway system. People said that was planned. I go, yeah, that was planned. And then it was A.C. Hall who implemented the Greenway system, but he was planning director over this explosion of urban sprawl that was experiencing our city. If you've been to Raleigh, he came up with the concept of these tree buffers along some of the thoroughfares, which is why we still have our natural beauty today. That was planned? Yes, that was planned. Then it was George Chapman, my immediate predecessor, where we started looking back at the downtown, and it was his thinking that helped start the transformation of our downtown. That was planned? Yes. That was planned. And during this whole time, you've seen this, businessmen fear our first comprehensive plan in 1979 will stifle city growth. Let's see if he's right. Nope. <laughs> How many have heard that before? What you're doing is going to choke growth. It will just kill economic development. And I had to save this, and I wish the man was still alive. But unfortunately, he passed on. He's probably in heaven going. Those planners were right again. <laughs> and not only that, but for 20 years, because our city embraced planning, we have consistently been ranked the best city in America because we embrace planning as our competitive advantage, and we continue to do so today. So as I travel, Elected officials, communities, they're looking for people that can address the uncertainty about the future. They're looking for those who have vision, solutions, big ideas, courage, that they can solve the tough challenges ahead. And planners, if you want to be valuable, you must show your value to your community. That is why this entire year, we're talking about that you need to lead, inspire, and innovate. Next year, we're going to start on the implementation. We're rolling out a Big Ideas Forum, both around the country and online. We want to hear from you about the big ideas, just like the days of Daniel Burnham and Ed Logue, that you can come up to solve these incredible problems in our country. And we encourage all of you, please, to participate and share your big ideas with us. Now, my question is, what will happen 20 to 30 years from now? I've been very blessed that my daughter gave me a letter about two years ago on Father's Day. I always have to be careful how I describe this letter because it was probably the most powerful letter I received and she finally understood what I did for a living and why I travel so much. 
And it really brought tears to my eyes to read this because she understood why. But then I said to myself, if I know these emerging issues, what about 20 and 30 years from now? And I find out that I forget my purpose or forgot my purpose as a planner, and then she'll look at me and she'll say, Dad, you knew about these emerging trends. <laughs> what happened? Where were you? How did you let this happen and you didn't speak up? I don't know how to answer that question. Where were you, Dad? Oh, I was out facilitating a public meeting. I'm sorry. <laughs> Where were you? And my grandson, that happens to be that little cute face you see there in the corner, isn't he adorable? He scares me because he kind of looks like me. <laughs> what am I going to say to my grandson? Grandpa, where were you? You knew about these issues. What are you gonna, why didn't you do anything? And I don't know what answer I'm going to have. So I'm going to ask you the question. 20 and 30 years from now, when your children and grandchildren or your siblings look at you and they say, where were you? Why didn't you speak up? Do you have an answer? This is what we're talking about, planning for future generations, being guardians of future generations because of them. And I want to bring back my father's generation of I want to give up my today for their tomorrow, and we need to adopt that as well. This conference is about that. The conference was designed to make you reinvent, reimagine, and reinvigorate. Reinvent your profession. Reimagine your role. Reinvigorate your sense of purpose. Use these days to get re-energized because of the important work that we need to do the minute you go back to your community. So in closing, don't remember me. I'll be present for another year. I ask you to remember my words. You cannot leave this conference the same. You can't. You cannot leave this conference the same. Your community needs you to solve these emerging challenges. And these sessions were designed to get you to rethink, reimagine your purpose. Remember the great legacy of planning you will leave behind for present and future generations. So this is not about us. Please sacrifice your today for their tomorrow. There is too much at stake. And so as I close, your community needs you, your country needs you, your planet needs you. Thank you.